All right. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Parker. I'm one of the leads for the performance engineering team here at ALCF. Uh, and I'm going to be presenting an overview of the two systems that will be coming to ALCF over the next year. I, I think that the original title of the talk was Future ALCF Systems, but I changed that to Upcoming because actually, for the most part, they're already starting to show up on the floor. So the, the future is not so far off. Um, so the first system I'd like to talk about is our newest one. Uh, the system is named Polaris. Uh, it was uh, recently delivered and accepted by the ALCF. Uh, and the final work is underway currently to make the system available to users. Uh, and that should be done in the next few months. So Polaris is a uh, 44 petaflop HPE system using NVIDIA A100 GPUs and the Slingshot Interconnect. It's composed of 40 racks, uh, 560 nodes, and over 2,000 GPUs. So if you've worked with other A100 systems like the NERSC Perlmutter system, uh, Polaris will probably look fairly familiar to you. It's, it's really not that. There are a few differences between it and Perlmutter, but uh, it's pretty similar. Um, so this slide is just showing a picture of Polaris you know, sitting on the floor in the Argon Data Center. Uh, it is currently number 12 on the top 500 list. And as I said, we expect it to be available to folks in the second half of, of this year um, for use. Um, so the, the node configuration of Polaris is shown here. It has a one 32 core AMD Milan CPU. So the, the figure is actually a little wrong. It says it lists the CPU as the older Milan 7532. And that's actually been upgraded to the 75. 43 Milan CPU. I, I don't think it's a big difference to most folks, but just so that this slide is not misleading, I couldn't unfortunately upgrade the graphic. Um, but it, it's a newer CPU uh, and uh, it, each node has 512 gigabytes of DDR4 memory, along with of course, four of the NVIDIA A100 GPUs that gives it its compute power. Uh, each of those have 40 gigabytes of uh, HBM2E memory. Uh, and, and the node is currently connected uh, to a Mellanox network card, but that will soon be upgraded or, or within the next coming few months, upgraded to the improved uh, uh, slingshot network cards um, that go with the full slingshot system. Um, and yeah, so slingshot is the network interconnect uh, for Polaris. And so this is the latest um, network interconnect for high performance computing coming out of uh, HPE Cray. Um, so, and it's being used by a number of other systems across the country and around the world, including Perlmutter, along with the ooh, Frontier, El Capitan, and Aurora. Uh, so, Slingshot introduces some new and enhanced features to improve network performance, such as uh, multiple QoS traffic classes, uh, aggress aggressive adaptive routing, and advanced congestion management. So these all work to sort of just smooth it, uh, you know, and improve the network performance at application C. So uh, as I said, currently Polaris is using the Slingshot 10 configuration, which consists of the Slingshot switches and Mellanox Ethernet NICs. So these are the cards that connect the, the nodes to the network. Um, and later this year, these will upgrade it to the Cassini NICs, which will make it uh, a full Slingshot 11 system. Uh, the results of which will be doubling the injection bandwidth from the nodes so they can shove data on and off the nodes twice as quickly. Uh, and then there'll be a number of uh, in-hardware MPI acceleration features in the Slingshot Cassini NICs that will help uh, improve MPI performance. So uh, once people are getting on shortly after that, you know, things should uh, net on, on the network side go a bit faster. Um, so Slingshot networks, at least all the ones that I'm aware of, including Polaris's, are configured in a Dragonfly topology. Um, so Dragonfly topology essentially means that the, the nodes are uh, broken into groups and there's sort of a, a, a slightly richer all-to-all -all connectivity within a group. And then there's these global links that have somewhat less bandwidth going between groups. So an application that sits within a group and communicates uh, does slightly better than one that is sort of spread out across the groups. Um, so uh, Polaris will have 10 of these uh, Dragonfly groups containing compute nodes in it. Um, and, and then the Polar programming environment for Polaris uh, will be the standard sort of Cray uh, PE software stack, 
along with the NVIDIA HPC Software Development Kit, or SDK. Uh, and this will provide a number of programming models, which are shown here. So in addition to the Cray and NVIDIA provided models of OpenMP, CUDA, and OpenACC, uh, we'll also have uh, installed on the system uh, Sickle, which is something we'll be using on Aurora, and Cocos and Raja, which are becoming increasingly popular in sort of the HPC world, uh, especially within the DOE, and also um, HIP, which is a, a version of CUDA, if you will, provided by AMD uh, that, that works on NVIDIA hardware. Um, okay, and one of the intended uses of Polaris is as a bridge to the upcoming Aurora system, uh, which is the Exascale system going into Argonne um, later this year. So while the GPU hardware is different, you know, Aurora will have Intel GPUs, Polaris has NVIDIA ones. There's a number of things in the software stack and in the overall environment, including the Slingshot network that will be the same. Um, so, you know, this slide is just showing some of the similarities, particularly in the software areas um, that will enable people that are developing for Polaris to you know, transition to Aurora uh, in future years. Um, so then uh, I, I'm moving on to talk about Aurora now. Uh, so as I mentioned, Aurora is uh, the exascale system that's coming uh, to Argon. Uh, we expect the hardware to show up this year and people to be able to get on the system next year. Um, it will have greater than two exaflops of double precision peak performance. So this should make it one of the fastest machines in the world at the time. Um, we will have over 9,000 nodes. And actually, I think in the latest announcements that Intel did, they, they stated that it's actually over 10,000 nodes. Um, so uh, slight uh, improvement in disclosure uh, there, uh, each of which will have uh, two Sapphire Rapid CPUs with high bandwidth memory on the CPU. So these CPUs will have significantly improved memory bandwidth over traditional CPUs using uh, DDR memory. Um, each node will also have six Intel Pontevecchio GPUs uh, and eight Slingshot NICs on them. And since we're using a Slingshot network, they will be connected in a Dragonfly topology similar to what we see on, on Polaris. Um, so overall, the system will have greater than 10 petabytes of memory, uh, and it will be attached to a 220 petabyte storage system um, and that's using a sort of a new file system layer called Deos that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, on the software front, it will provide an HPC oriented software environment um, with C, C++ and Fortran compilers, along with Sickle, OpenMP, Cocos and Roger programming models. So very similar to what we saw uh, on Polaris. And in addition, it will come with a number of standard Intel tools and libraries, which will all have support for the new Intel GPUs. Uh, so I'm happy to say that uh, in the last few months, uh, the cabinets for Aurora have uh, shown up and been installed in the Argon data center. And this is, you know, what the pictures are showing is the installation of the racks um, at, at the Argon data center. So un unfortunately, these racks are still uh, not populated with the, uh, the compute blades. So the silicon part of the system will be coming later, uh, later this year. But the racks have been connected to the facility's power and cooling infrastructure. So they're pretty much ready to go once we get the, the compute blades um, on the floor and into the machine. And you know, prior to the arrival of the full Aurora system, you know, over the last two, three years, we've been actively working to prepare uh, using a number of different test beds um, that are shown on this slide. Um, so these have been extremely useful for applications development testing with the uh, Intel uh, software stack that will be used on Aurora. So until recently, our, our very recently, in fact, our, our main test bed was called Arcticus, and that had some Intel GPU on it that were sort of precursors to the ones that are going into Aurora. Um, but in the last couple of weeks, we've brought up our latest test bed called Florentia. Uh, and that has four early silicon PVC GPUs on the node. So we've gotten our first PVC hardware. Um, they're a slightly earlier version of the GPU um, that will be going into Aurora. So they don't quite have the same level of performance, but they're you know, a good opportunity for us to, to test out the, the hardware, uh, you know, the PVC uh, in advance of getting the final version. Um, and then later this year, we'll be getting our first uh, Aurora nodes, and they will go into what we call a test and development system named Sunspot. And so that will give us actual sort of Aurora hardware going into Aurora racks um, on a smaller scale that we can test on uh, this year. And then next year, the full Aurora system 
will be starting to become available to users. Um, and so uh, Aurora is the first large scale system that will be using the new Intel Pontiac Vecchio G HPC GPUs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, each node will contain six of these GPUs and they'll be connected in an all to all fashion on the node. And as, as I said, as shown here, they'll also on the node will be six Sapphire Rapid uh, Xeon CPUs and eight Slingshot uh, Fabric Endpoints. So while, you know, uh, Intel GPUs are somewhat new uh, or are new for HPC applications. Uh, GPUs in general are not a new thing for Intel. Intel's been building GPUs uh, for a long time, uh, starting with their Gen 1 GPUs going back over 10 years. Um, and this has evolved over a series of generations. Uh, and in the most recent generation, Gen 12, has now been rebranded as the XE GPU line uh, in accordance with Intel's broader aims in the GPU market space. But if you have an Intel laptop or a laptop with an Intel uh, chip in it as, as the processor, you probably have an Intel CPU or a GPU in there too. And we've actually been using the Gen 9s quite successfully uh, for the last couple of years to develop and prepare applications for Aurora, the full Aurora software stack runs on, believe it or not, on the Gen 9 hardware, uh, despite it being significantly lower powered um, than what we'll be seeing on Aurora. So, so there's a lot of continuity in what Intel has been doing. Um, so while this seems sort of like a new venture for Intel, it's really just a scaling up of their, uh, their GPUs um, that they've been developing for years. And, you know, in line with this, they're, they're moving towards offering, you know, a number of different GPU products that target different parts of the GPU market. Um, so, you know, the, the ones that will, that have been available in the past and will continue to be available are what they call the low power versions, um, as integrated GPUs and laptops. Um, and so the latest version, uh, is out in some of their newest, uh, laptops, their gen 12 XC low power GPU. But in addition to these low power GPUs, there will now be a range of higher power GPUs ranging from the HPG for gaming, uh, line to the HP line, which is targeted at data centers and AI to finally the most powerful version, uh, which is the HPC oriented GPUs, uh, that we'll be using on, uh, on Aurora, but all of these sort of have, um, you know, a common roots, roots in a common architecture um, that, that spans across the family. Um, so, so to give people a little bit of flavor of what the, uh, the Intel GPU architecture looks like and how it may be similar or different um, from other G GPUs, I want to kind of give a brief overview of the, the main components of their architecture. So I won't be going into detail here, but this will be providing sort of a high high level view. Um, so the basic element of an Intel GPU has been and continues to be what they call the execution unit. And this is in essence, just a very simple core um, with the com com kind of components you commonly find in most computing cores. So there's a register file, uh, there's ports to issue instructions to different pipelines, um, separate vector pipelines for different types of, of instructions, including integer, floating point, et cetera. Um, and uh, one thing that's a little different is these cores just have a sort of what Intel calls a send unit that you know forwards memory requests um, to a, a common load store unit that's shared on what Intel calls a slice. So a slice is uh, a number of EUs that have been gathered together that share resources uh, such as cache and local memory and others with uh, fixed functional units that are used mostly for graphics. Um, and one of the things that's going to make a difference between the different flavors of Intel GPUs is which of these, are, you know, kind of fixed functional units uh, that are shown in green you get on your GPU. So if ones that are used for high performance computing may lack some of the functionality that's used in actual graphics applications like ray tracing and things like that. Um, so uh, on these slices, now Intel's changed their terminology a little bit. So if you look at the graphics, it says subslice. Uh, Intel's in the last several months. Uh, change some of the terminology they use here. And so sub slices are now called slices. So um, these slices, um, in addition to the EUs and the thread dispatch and the cache also contain the, the shared uh, load store unit for, uh, for the slice that connects it to the memory subsystem. Um, and then uh, most GPUs sort of have this hierarchical structure and where a number of like these sort of smaller components are, are built up and integrated into a, a big, progressively bigger components until you get to the full GPU. And that's, you know, the same approach that Intel's taking. And so a number of these 
slices are integrated together into what Intel is now calling a stack. Um, and these stacks, you know, have these series of slices plus um, some additional functional units uh, shown here in green um, that, that are optional on the uh, different variants of GPUs. And then a number of these stacks uh, are integrated together to build the, the complete GPU. And so along with the stacks, you get a, la you know, a large last level cache um, in most cases. And then again, some additional, you know, optional functional units for media and things like that. Um, and, and so what's one of the big distinguishing features of the different GPUs that you see out there and the power that a given GPU has is the number of stacks and slices that they have. So that's why you can have something that goes all the way from, you know, a small integrated GPU all the way up to a, you know, multi petaflop or, uh, uh, you know, GPU, uh, HPC GPU. Um, it's just this scaling of these, you know, uh, functional units and, and these various components into larger and larger groups. Um, so uh, we aren't presently able to give the full details of the Intel Ponte Vecchio GPU yet. Hopefully that will be something that we can talk about in more depth later this year. But Intel had a, what they called an architecture day last year where they provided an intro to the PVC uh, GPU. And so I borrowed a few of their slides here. Um, and anybody that's interested in knowing more, there's a link there that you can go to and that will give you the, you know, as, as full of details as Intel's released today. So in this presentation, Intel outlined uh, some of the components that make up the PVC GPU, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the next couple of slides, along with providing some of the initial performance figures uh, for prototype silicon. So this is not final silicon, but early versions off the fab that are being tested uh, and then expected to be improved. So they call these A0 versions. Um, and so you can see things like, you know, they give a few details like noting that it has greater than 45 teraflops of uh, FP32 performance on the, on the GPU. Um, and, and so, you know, in, in lines with the, what I described earlier uh, with the architecture, what you can see is Intel has shown um, that the um, XE uh, cores or, uh, you know, um, execution units consist of eight vector engines and eight matrix engines. So these will do the sort of tensor operations that you've seen on other GPUs, along with containing a 512 kilobyte L1 cache that can be you know, dynamically configured or partitioned into either a cache or a shared local memory that's managed by the application itself. Uh, 16 of these XE cores uh, or EUs are grouped together to form a slice. And then four slices are combined along with a large L2 cache um, I think they give the, the L2 cache size uh, in some of their materials as being greater than 200 uh, megabytes. Um, and then four HBM uh, 2E memory controllers to form a stack. Um, and then one or more of these stacks can be put together on the same die to form a, a complete GPU. Um, so that's the Intel PVC GPU. Um, another, you know, sort of novel feature that Aurora will have uh, will be the file system. And big systems, big compute systems need big, fast I.O. systems to keep them fed. Um, and the I.O. system that we'll be using on Aurora is called DEOS, which stands for Distributed Asynchronous Object Store. Um, so the DEOS file system will be large at 230 petabytes and fast, having over 25 terabytes per second of bandwidth uh, on and off the nodes. Um, and in addition, uh, there's some novel aspects to Deos where it offers a new sort of storage API that will enable new capabilities. However, one of the nice things is that for people who don't want to take advantage of that novelty, uh, it will look very familiar. It supports all of the traditional existing I.O. models that people have been using today, including standard POSIX I.O., MPI I.O., and HDF5. So for people that are, for most people, this will look just like a big fast file system. Um, but yeah, there, there will be some new capabilities that could be utilized on it once it's in production. Um, and so I want to take a quick look at the, at the overall HPC landscape, uh, particularly here in the US and in the DOE complex. And, and what you'll note is, um, you know, the, the machines that have gone in recently over the last few years and the machines that are all coming up all have the, you know, there's a variety of CPUs and GPUs that are going into them, but they're all GPU accelerated systems. And so at least in the, you know, the near-term future, the foreseeable future, um, you know, people in the DOE world will be primarily working at large scale with, with GPU accelerated platforms. And that brings up some interesting 
uh, you know, development and software challenges uh, as to how to utilize these systems, how to utilize them well, and how to, you know, consider writing code that might be portable across them. And so now I want to take a, a look at um, the a software stack that will be on it in the Intel platform or on Aurora. And then also, you know, talk a little bit about how we're trying to make this easier to use and more portable for folks that are coming to Aurora or running across these multiple platforms. Um, so uh, the main programming environment uh, for Aurora is based on Intel's One API products. Uh, One API is sort of an industry specification and a, uh, a product set from Intel. Um, so this provides the specification for impl Intel's implementation of the SQL programming model, which I'll talk about later, and also includes another of a number of other libraries and APIs that Intel you know, thinks should be standard across these platforms. Um, so uh, in, in addition to this sort of one API specification, Intel provides a number of software toolkits uh, branded with one API. Uh, which contain Intel's implementation of their One API specification, along with their, you know, uh, a set of Intel compilers uh, for languages such as Fortran, C, C++, and Python, and a lot of familiar libraries like MKL, DNN, and DAL, plus Intel's, uh, you know, tool chain for performance analysis, uh, which includes Advisor VTune, and for debugging, uh, which includes ins Inspector. So the, the programming models that will be uh, available on Aurora includes the ones that come with uh, the One API software, which are SQL, OpenMP, and OpenCL. Uh, but in addition to that, we'll be providing uh, Cocos and Raja. Um, Aurora, however, won't provide CUDA as, CUDA as a proprietary programming model to NVIDIA. Um, however, there is an alternative to CUDA called HIP, which has been developed by AMD for AMD GPUs. And work has been underway to provide an experimental, and I emphasize experimental version uh, of that on Aurora. But we do hope to see that progress into a more full-fledged uh, portable programming model that could be used across you know, all of the GPU platforms that are out there today. Um, so I, I mentioned SICL. Um, I, some folks may be familiar with it, but um, SICL is, is a relatively new programming model um, for heterogeneous systems. It's, it's actually been around for a little while. Uh, it was introduced, I think, first in 2014, but it's really sort of just started to see broader use and adoption in the last few years. Um, but the, the latest, you know, SICL continues to evolve and the latest SICL standard uh, for SICL 2020 was just released last year. Um, so SQL is a, a sort of C++ way of offloading code to a GPU that takes a lot of lessons learned from what did and didn't work in OpenCL and applies them to C++. Uh, and for the better, I think most people believe. Um, so while SQL is an open standard uh, that has several current implementations, uh, one of them is from Intel and Intel calls their implementation of SQL DPC++. Uh, and so, so DPC++ is really Intel's implementation of SQL plus a few extensions. And many of those extensions have since been brought into the SQL 2020 standards. So in, in many ways, DPC++ is very analogous to SQL uh, currently and probably will be you know, going forward into the future. Um, so this implementation from Intel is open source. It's available on GitHub. And um, it has the ability to be extended to other platforms. And so this has already been done to support uh, codes running on NVIDIA and AMD GPUs using uh, the DPC++ implementation of SQL. Um, so another important programming model for Aurora is OpenMP. Um, this is one that we've been working closely with Intel to ensure that is highly optimized for Aurora. Uh, so many folks are probably familiar with OpenMP. It's been around for a long time. Uh, and since version 4.5, it's included pragmas that allow offloading to GPUs. Um, and an important feature of this programming model is that unlike most of the other ones, it works with both C, C++, and Fortran. And for Fortran codes, it's, it's probably the primary option these days for programming portably across GPUs. Um, and so multiple platforms uh, and GPU vendors have announced they will have some degree of OpenMP support for their platform. So we do anticipate that it is you know, one of the possible portable programming models for, for, for GPU systems today. And I do wanna kind of emphasize that, you know, Intel has committed to strong support of Fortran for Aurora. So the initial implementation of Intel's Fortran compiler for uh, GPUs will support uh, up to Fortran 2008 and OpenMP5. Um, 
And you know, Intel's been uh, basically re-implementing their Fortran compiler uh, for both their CPUs and their GPUs. Uh, and what we're seeing is, you know, on the GPU front, it's been maturing rapidly, and we expect that you know it will be as robust on the GPU side as Intel CPU uh, Fortran compiler has been, you know, in the near future. Um, so we see it as a you know a completely viable option to run Fortran codes using OpenMP on Aurora. Um, so I, I did mention this before, but I wanted to reiterate. So you know a number of Intel's uh, performance tools uh, will be available on Intel GPUs and on Aurora, including VTune and Advisor. Um, so if you've used these tools before on other platforms, um, they will be fairly familiar to you, uh, and you'll be able to use them on the Aurora system once it's available. Um, in addition to the, the tools, uh, Intel will be providing many of their standard libraries, including MKL for Intel GPUs. And we you know, are working with Intel to deploy a fully optimized version of MKL on Aurora. And in addition um, to MKL, there will be libraries to support um, you know, learning and analytics applications, uh, including uh, the one DNN library and the one doll library. Um, so now I, I want to take the last few slides here, talk a little bit about the work that's been going on to prepare applications for Aurora. Um, so ALCF and Intel have been working with over 40 projects from the ALCF's Early Science Program and from the Exascale Computing Project uh, to prepare them for Aurora. So many of these codes, the projects contain more than one code. So in total, we've been actively working with more than 50 applications and software packages to get them ready for the system. Uh, this has involved work from uh, over 60 people at Argonne and Intel uh, and, and many, many more external collaborators. So it's been a big effort. Uh, and, and today we're seeing you know, significant progress in getting these applications ready for Aurora. Um, so you know, we, we periodically take uh, a look at how, how this work is progressing. Uh, and then we generally look at you know, a few different areas um, of how the application's work is proceeding. In particular, we look at their implementation of their science and algorithms. So many of these codes have significantly changed the, you know, their capabilities and implementations to take advantage of the you know, exascale, upcoming exascale platforms, both here and at other facilities. Um, so there's been some major work done on the, the science and the algorithms deployed. Um, all these codes need to be ported to an Aurora programming model uh, in order to run on the systems. And um, you know, they all need to be tested with the Aurora software stack on the Aurora test beds, and then tuned for performance on the Aurora hardware, and finally tested for scaling across the full Aurora system. So the charts at the bottom here just show uh, some of the progress that we've seen over the last couple of years in the first two areas. So uh, in terms of science implementations, we've seen you know, most you know, fairly steady, 75% of our, the codes that we're working with report having a full implementation you know, of their science ready to run on the platforms when they're avail available. And there's another eight to 12 codes that are continuing to work in this area and get ready. And in porting, we've seen a steady increase in the number of codes uh, that have been ported, fully ported to an Aurora programming model. And in particular, we saw a big jump in just the last quarter in the number of codes reporting being fully ported. Um, so at this point, we now have over half of our codes pull, fully ported, and most of the rest are, you know, well along the way, um, you know, sort of to being ported, and we just, you know, um, identified them as being partially ported here. Um, and this table shows you know, sort of a snapshot of the, the state of the applications in terms of their ability to run and achieve the desired level of performance on the Arcticus test beds. Uh, so I'll note this data is, is a little bit old. It's a, a little over a month old at this point, and it's, things have been changing rapidly. So you know, this is a little bit of an outdated snapshot. Um, but we're seeing that you know, several applications, including XGC, NWCMX, SW4, and Hack, have all achieved you know, um, good levels of performance on the Arcticus test bed and you know, expect, you know, indicating that we expect to see them be able to run well on the upcoming PDC hardware that we have. We also see a number of codes you know, shown in a lighter shade of green that are running and um, you know, actively investigating and improving their performance. Um, shown in yellow are, you know, there's a number of codes that have been able to run their test case uh, representative of their end goal on Aurora, but may have a few issues that they're they're still ironing out before they start looking at performance in detail. Um, and there are some codes shown in orange that are not yet fully running, but they have various portions of their code that are able to run, or they're able to run the full code, but they have some sig significant workarounds in place that we want to you know be able to get rid of um, before they're you know running in production. 
Um, and at this point, we only have a few codes that are being sort of blocked or gated by issues that we're working with Intel to resolve. And there are a few other codes that haven't really had a chance to do much testing yet. They're usually, you know, parts of projects that have been focusing on other uh, applications, you know, initially. So uh, overall, we're seeing some pretty good, uh, you know, uh, progress in the application readiness for Aurora. And, you know, this is work is continuing throughout this year to really uh, have, you know, as many, if not all of these applications ready to run on machine once it hits the floor uh, and is available next year. Um, so with that, I will stop and uh, take any questions.